dear students today we'll be discussing about energy economics primarily we'll be discussing about the needs of energy economics and different schemes by which we can analyze a system so let us look into this figure which represents the share of primary energy like fossil fuel contribution is close to 80 percent in the year 2019 and 2020 and it is expected that it will slowly decrease in the energy mix. So, why this is so like 80 percent of the energy is coming from the fossil based fuel because fossil fuels provide energy at lowest cost. If we look into this figure we can see at this year about 2019-2020 its share is close to 20 and it is expected that it will increase with years and by 2050 it will be more than 60 percent energy which will be contributed from renewable energy sector. The cost advantage of fossil fuels over renewable energy sources has been decreasing in recent years which is visible if we see the energy mix of global as well as national. Certain renewables can already compete with fossil fuels solely on financial terms. Renewable energy costs are expected to decline further in future while fossil fuel prices will luckily to rise because it is going from surface to the deeper and deeper which requires lot of investment for extracting the minerals or fossil fuels from the deep of the mother earth. So, if we consider this figure which is taken from IRENA, it shows the price in last 10 years like if you consider 2010 to 2020 how this price scenario has changed. If we primarily consider solar photovoltaic concentrated solar power and wind farm both onshore and offshore you can see the significant drop in price. So, this vertical axis shows the price 2020 and USD per kilowatt hour. So, you can see from here to here it is a significant reduction in price because of the innovations and uh, new research and development in these areas and also CSP which is concentrated solar power or concentrating solar power it is decreasing significantly in last 10 years that means in a band of 10 years from 2010 to 2020. And of course, there are few cases like in case of geothermal there is a slight increase and also hydro there is a slight increase, but that is not so significant. Most importantly this fossil cost also biomass contributed in this power generation system this cost is almost constant. So, in this context we would like to define one term called levelized cost of energy which represents the present value of building and operating a plant over an assumed lifetime expressed in real terms to remove the effect of inflation. The levelized costs are then divided by the total energy obtained to allow direct comparisons across different energy sources. Okay. Now, let us define a term called net energy ratio which is expressed as the ratio of energy available for final consumption to the energy required to produce it. So, if you see this figure, so you can see the net energy ratio of different energy sources. So, if we look into this 
hydro power its net energy ratio is more than 100 followed by coal which is 80 net energy ratio. That means what this energy is concentrated in those energy resources compared to the other resources. So, what you can say a large net energy ratio means we get lots of useful energy from a small energy investment as with the original oil deposits. Okay? And this has been reported in these two publications. Also, the same publications they have pointed out like if by 2030 all the energy sources are expected to come from renewables, then how infrastructural requirement will vary. So, it is estimated that about 50 percent energy supply will come from wind turbines followed by 20 percent from concentrated solar power plants, 14 percent from solar PV power plants, then 6 percent from rooftop solar PV power plants, then we will have geothermal hydroelectric plants which will be contributing about 4 percent and then wave and tidal will contribute 1 percent and number of plants required in the world wide also estimated which is reported here. Now, we need the best solution how this energy can be saved because energy saving is nothing but the saving of money. So, we have different schemes. Let us discuss some of the interesting schemes like we must increase the domestic manufacturing of renewable equipment, then reducing institutional barriers, then grounding renewables in the economic analysis and applying market principles, enhancing transmission grids and supporting transmission integration, then hybridization of technologies and appropriate and cost effective storage systems, hybrid energy storage systems which may connect solar energy, wind energy and maybe some very matured energy storage systems like pumped hydro energy storage systems. In this context, I would like to share one interesting hybrid systems where two different renewable energy sources are connected that is solar and wind farms and then there is a pumped hydro systems. So, here when there is a extra energy that means in off peak periods this energy can be used to pump water from lower reservoir to a higher reservoir during that time this system will work as motor and when we need energy during peak hours this energy which is stored in the form of potential energy can be used and expanded to produce electricity. The integration of solar PV, wind energy and pump hydro energy storage system is a hybrid system enables seamless grid integration by optimizing energy production, storage and distribution and this contributing to a more stable and sustainable energy supply. We can also think of some other schemes say for example, total energy approach how we can go for energy saving schemes. What are the objective of total energy approach? It is something like complete use of energy available to a system. Then we can reduce lot of waste energy. Then utilization of all the released energy in a power plant at different temperatures. So, by looking into the applications we can extract the energy based on the temperature. It may be multi fluid couple cycle, may be cogeneration of power and heat, combined plants and continuous running of plants at maximum load. So, now let us 
learn something about cogeneration. Cogeneration is defined as the combined production of power and useful thermal energy by the sequential use of fuel or fuels. Primarily, we have two configurations. First is cogeneration with back pressure turbine and other one is cogeneration with pass out turbine. So, here this is a boiler turbine in place of condenser we will have process heater. So, by controlling this pressure we can control the temperature and then finally, we can find out what temperature we need to operate this process heater. So, that way we can control this turbine and we can get the process heater at fixed temperature because there are some applications where isothermal condition systems are required. So, by doing so we can extract the steam at certain temperature and that can be utilized to meet the demand of the particular process. So, here we are having electricity in the turbine that means, work done if we have then if we connect a generator then we can produce electricity and then we will have process heater right. In the second mode of cogeneration we will have pass out turbine. So, what we can do the steam during the expansion can be used for a process heater ok. So, that way we can have this heat as well as this turbine work and also here we need to reject some amount of energy in the condenser. So, now if we are interested to know the feasibility of a cogeneration plant then how we will go ahead. So, for a cogeneration plant with heat input Q 1 and soft output W t and process it Q h then we can write down the expression for efficiency of a cogeneration plant is W t plus Q h divided by Q 1. So, this is nothing but input and these two are the output. Now, let us consider two different plants and one plant will produce thermal energy and other plant will produce soft work. So, this plant one is for generation of thermal energy and plant two is for turbine work. So, here if we write the efficiency eta h is something like q h by q 1 and from here we can find out what is the heat supply in terms of q h. It is something like q h and then you have eta h. In this case we can write this eta e is w t by q 1 and we can write heat supplied q 1 is w t by eta e. So, this q 1 is same for both the plants plant 1 and plant 2. So, for combination of the two cycles what you can write net output divided by net input. So, output is q h for plant 1 and w t for plant 2 that is how we can write w t plus q u and this is input is q 1. So, q 1 is nothing but q h by eta h for plant 1 and w t by eta e for plant 2. So, that is how we can write w t by eta e for this and q h by eta h for plant 1 ok. That is how we can write the combined cycle efficiency. Now, let us define a term called E which is nothing but W t divided by Q h plus W t. So, if we use the other expressions and if we try to express in terms of E the eta c is express or may be express something like this ok. Now, we can analyze the condition of feasibility. So, here condition should be eta c o has to be greater than eta c ok. 
a cogeneration plant is only advisable from an economic point of view if the cost of electricity generated is less than that purchased from the utility system. This is one condition. If a utility is not available, cogeneration becomes necessarily irrespective of the cost of the generation. Second point. Third point is a very low value of E is not economical for cogeneration, right? That things we need to keep in mind while suggesting a cogeneration plant for a existing power plant. Also, you can think of combining cycles. So, heat discharge from one heat engine is not wasted into the atmosphere, but serves as the source of for the source for the next heat engine. That is how we can think of like in case of simple gas turbine. So, we have compressor turbine and also we need a combustion chamber. So, air comes from the ambient and this compresses and passes through the combustion chamber and then it is expanded produce turbine work and if it is connected to generator we can produce electricity. This exhaust is at very high temperature in case of gas turbine and if we see the electrical output is about 20 percent and waste is about 80 percent because it has the capability to operate steam turbine or we can produce steam from water. So, that is how it has high potential. So, that is how it is said by superposing a high temperature power plant as a topping unit in a steam plant higher thermal efficiency can be achieved. So, if this is the case then if we do that then what will happen? So, this is gas turbine cycle then exit of the gas turbine is used to generate steam which is known as heat recovery steam generator and then we can produce electricity right and then we can do a lot of things which is after the plant like you can have sequestration. So, in this scheme like we can augment the electrical efficiency significantly so up to 45 percent and waste is remains as 55 percent. So, again there is a scope of utilization of this wastes for value added products. Again we can think of this way we have ZT plant from here we can generate electricity if we connect a generator and then this is the heat recovery generator. If that exit is not sufficient enough then we can use solar field or solar concentrator to raise the temperature and exchange with water to produce steam and that may be expanded in steam turbine and we can produce electricity by using a generator. And then exit is condensed and then we can pump back to the closed loop and it will work in a loop. So, here we are spending lot of energy in cooling and then also pumping water. So, there are always scopes of improvement in all those schemes for energy recovery which tells about savings of money. Now, let us pay attention about the energy economics, how we can define it. Energy economics is the field of study concerning supply of energy for human consumption and the financial implications involved in the same. So, current global energy crisis is of threefold. First is dart of energy resources to meet up with the growing demand. Climate issues arising from the utilization of fossil fuels and then volatility of energy prices brings huge disparities in economics and this is where energy economics comes in. If we look into the histories of energy economics, 
the oil embargo which was in 1970s encourages researcher to create a specialized branch of economics called energy economics. There is a drastic increase of fuel prices in 1973-74 which accelerates the importance of energy in economic development of countries. In 1980s inclusion of renewable energy, in 1990s liberalization of energy markets and restructuring becomes a new world order and by the beginning of 21st century energy shortage and climate change was largely felt and energy economics becomes an important topic of research. Why we need to learn precisely the economics, especially energy economics? The energy economics and planning helps to optimize the allocation of funds which are financially more rewarding besides being socially acceptable and environmentally sustainable. The economic feasibility studies helps the management makes sound investment decisions for capital incentive projects. Prior to investing in a project, the four factors need to be concerned. Number one, initial capital cost or net investment, net operating cash inflows, economic life and salvage value. Many failures can be avoided by proper understanding of financial strength and weaknesses. We also need to know something about law of demand and supply because economics is governed by the rule of demand and supply which mainly predicts if supply drops with respect to the demand price will rise here it is shown and if demand exceeds if demand exceeds supply the price will rise again price will rise here but what is more important for us is the equilibrium price which is nothing but the price at which supply the supply line this is the demand line exactly match so this point is very very important and this point is known as the equilibrium price okay so horizontal axis is quantity and vertical axis is price so this intersection point is very very important for us and the price at this point is known as the equilibrium price also we must have some idea about energy saving projects like any organization who is thinking about investing money in an energy saving projects will ask two things how much money will be saved and how long it will take to get the return on the initial investment and it is a very complex thing. So, saving of energy will save money but this saving may be offset by the cost of the equipment which is needed to achieve the savings. The energy manager thus has to use some method of analysis to decide whether or not to invest in a new schemes. So, there are two schemes primarily expensive to run, but have low capital cost this is one scheme and second scheme is more expensive to purchase but having lower running cost. So, now as a energy manager we need to think which one will be the appropriate because it involves money. Energy manager requires some systematic method to evaluate the schemes and come to a conclusion about this investment. That is how we need to learn the different techniques how we can achieve it or get help to know 
Path scheme will be appropriate for a particular investment. If we talk about capital investment, this can be pictured as expenditure from which benefit can be expected in the long run. Most energy saving schemes require an initial investment for new equipment to achieve energy savings. The monetary value of the savings which will invariably show as reduced fuel cost must recover the initial cost in as short a time as possible. So, there are two cases like if the initial capital is borrowed money then interest will be charged. Interest charges are one of the two types like simple and compound because this investment are not so small. So, we need to take loan from the bank and then we need to invest it. So, when we are taking loan then we need to think of the interest then how much interest to be paid and then when we are going to complete the payment of the investment. Okay. So, in order to study all those aspects we need to know cash flow diagram and then other terminologies and then we will discuss some of the other tools which are required. Cash flow diagram is nothing but a graphical representation of cash flows drawn on the time frame. Okay. So, this is the time frame and this axis is like sales and this is like investment or you can say positive is receipts and negative is disbursement. Okay. And this time scale is divided into equal intervals and these are known as interest period. As I said this vertical arrows pointing upward indicate positive cash flows that means cash receipt or income, income will also come here and this down arrow is for negative cash flows like cost or disbursement right and also we must know what is net cash flow it is nothing but receipt minus disbursement right ok. Now, let us also learn some of the important terminologies like principal amount the amount of money considered initially that is called principal amount interest is the payment other than the borrowed made for an amount borrowed from a bank or a financer and the cost of capital is the minimum rate of interest an investor expects to earn on their investment. Number of time periods the number of time interval over which amount of money is being borrowed or invested and salvage value is revenue attributed to disposing of the investment at the end of its useful life. Okay. Suppose today we have purchased one item its cost is about say 20,000 dollar and maybe after 10 years its value is maybe 5 years. So, that value is known as salvage value. We will have interest rate right which is defined as a measure of productivity of money as a resource or a measure of investor performance for the time value of money. We can have simple interest, simple interest is directly proportional to the capital invested interest rate and number of interest periods. The total invest I on the principal P with an interest rate I over an interval we can express as I is equal to P n I okay, this is small i. So, that is how we can find out what is simple interest. Also we can find out compound interest. So, how do we define compound interest? When the simple interest 
is added to the principal amount such that the resulting amount becomes the principal for the next term. The interest so obtained is called the compound interest. Also, we define a term called future value of an investment amount P at an interest rate I compounded annually over interest period N which is defined as F is equal to P multiplied by 1 plus I to the power of N. So, if we take an example, the future value of investment of an amount of rupees 15,000 compounded annually at the rate of 8 percent at the end of 5 years then f will be 15,000 multiplied by 1 plus 0 0.08 to the power of 5 is something like this. So, we can find out the future value of a particular investment after certain period of time if we know the rate of interest. Also, we need to know the effect of inflation on cash flows. The monetary inflation occurs when the purchasing power of a currency declines or in other words there is a general increase in the level of prices in the economy. So, that condition is known as inflation. If C naught is the present cost of a commodity and Z1, Z2, Z3 and Zn is the rate of inflation in the year 1 to n, then its cost at the end of corresponding years will be C1 is equal to C0 1 plus Z1, then C2 is C0 1 plus Z1 multiplied by 1 plus Z2. So, that way we can do the multiplications and Cn will be something like this. And if Z is the average rate of inflation during year 0 to year n, then the cost of C0 surges to Cn which can be designated by using this expression C n is equal to C naught 1 plus z to the power of n. Now, let us learn about payback period. Payback period refers to the number of years required to recover the initial outlay of investment. Okay. Simple payback period is NSP is obtained by calculating the number of years it takes for cumulative cash recipients B n to equal the cash expenses C n. So, this is the cash receipts and C n is the expenses. So, we can write down this expression summation of n is equal to 0 to n s p B n minus C n is equal to 0. So, if we take an example a proposed solar PV street light cost is about 15,000 and last for 20 years. The saving is saving in electricity is estimated as 2000 per year. We can straight away estimate the payback period by using this expression 15,000 divided by 2000 is will be 7.5 years. Now, if we look into the discounted payback period which accounts for the changing value of the money over time. So, N D P discounted payback period in N that satisfies this equation. So, if we take one more example the cash flows of three project proposals during their lifetime of 3 years which is given below, we need to calculate the payback period and discounted payback period if the rate of interest is 10 percent. So, this is for project 1, project 2 and project 3 and this is the number of years 0 to 5. Okay? You can see the census here. Okay? So, negative is investment and this is the cash flows you can see here. Now, you can do the calculations because here current and cumulative we need to find out. So, you can very easily find out, but minus 2400 plus 700 is minus 1700 and this plus 700 will be 
minus 1000 then this plus 700 will be 300 which will be minus and d minus 300 plus 700 will be 400 and 400 plus 700 will be 1100. So, similarly you can do for other projects as well. So, now assuming that rupees 700 for project 1 and 750 and 1150 for project 2 and 3 respectively are uniformly distributed over fourth year. So, what you can notice here this is minus till third year ok minus till third year this is also minus three till third year. So, something will be change will be here that means, 0 will be there in between third and fourth year and of course, it will be in the fourth years. So, we can find out here we cannot say that it will be held in four years always because it is happening in third year in between it might happen ok. So, that is how we can say for project 1 we can determine something like 3 plus 300 by 700 it will be 3.43 3 years and project 2 it is 3 plus 150 by 750 it will be 3.2 and in project 3 it will be 3 ok 3 plus 150 by 1150 which will be equal to 3.13 3 years right. So, p back period will be 3.13 3 years for project 3 which is minimum if you compare the given 3 different projects ok. So, we need to find out the senses negative to positive where it will be 0 right ok. Now, if we are interested about discounted period that can also be carried out. So, discounted we can find out here. So, if we start with like 700 then it will be something like discounted cash flow 700 divided by 1 plus i to the power of n. So, for this case it is 700 divided by 1 plus if its interest rate if we consider what is given to us in the problem is 10 percent. So, then we can consider 1.1 to the power of n. So, this is 1. So, that way we can have this is discounted cash flow and then what we did minus 2400 0 plus 636 then what we will have minus 1764 and then we do the calculation for year 2 then it will be something like 2 here then discounted cash flow will be 578 and the cumulative things will be minus 1764 plus 578 it will be minus 1186 accordingly you can calculate for all as well as for project 2 and 3. So, here you can find out the payback period for project 1 it is up to year 4 it is minus 183, but year 5 it is 251. So, what you can do payback period for project 1 is like 4 years is required 4 plus 183 divided by 434. So, it will be 4.42 years. Similarly, we can find out the payback period for project 2 and 3. So, here you can see project 4 project 2 it is minus 27 till 4th year and 439 in the fifth year. So, somewhere it will be 0. So, payback period for project 2 will be 4 plus 27 by 466 then 4.06 and similarly for project 3 it is 3.72 years. So, we can find out the payback period if it is discounted. Now, let us discuss about the other scheme called net present value. In this method, the present value of future cash flow is determined by discounting. Costs are represented as negative values and savings as positive values. So, it can be calculated by using this expression NPV is equal to summation of z is equal to 0 to n 
b j minus c j divided by 1 plus i to the power of j. What is b j and c j? Is b j is the benefits and c j is the cost at the end of the project period say j and n is the useful life of the project this is the n and if c naught is the initial capital investment and a is the uniform annual cash flow of the project then we can define the npv is equal to c naught minus a multiplied by 1 plus i to the power of n minus 1 divided by i multiplied by 1 plus i to the power of n and of course our target is to have higher values of NPV because higher values of NPV which is more desirable in the project. So, let us consider one more exercise the cash flows of three projects or project proposals during their lifetime of three years are given which is represented by project 1, project 2 and project 3. We need to find out the NPV of the project and we need to consider interest is 10 percent. So, we can do it very easily. We know the current values and discounted cash flow we know like we need to use 700 divided by 1 plus i to the power of n. So, i is 10 percent that means 1.1 to the power of n then 700. So, if it is 0 then 700, if it is 1 then we will get 636 and if n is equal to 2 then we will have 578, if it is 3 then 525, if it is 4 then 478 and if it is 5 434. Okay. And then we will have this cumulative part, we can add this minus 2400 plus 66 we will have minus 1764, then 1764 plus 578, minus 1186, minus 1186 plus 525, it is minus 661. Similarly, you can do it and finally, in at the end of 5 years, we will have 251 is the cumulative value. And for project 2, similarly, you can do it and at the end of 5 years, we will have 439 is the value and for project 3, at the end of 5 years, we have 1057 is the value. So, these values are nothing but the net present value of the project 1, 2 and 3. Okay? Now, let us learn internal rate of return which is also one of the important tool and how we can do it? Once we know the NPV value, we need to find out at what interest rate NPV is equal to 0. So, that interest rate is nothing but your internal rate of return. So, it is the interest rate that makes the NPV value of an investment 0. So, NPV of 0 is the minimum value that would make the investment worthwhile. Mathematically, IIR is calculated as NPV I star is equal to summation of j is equal to 0 to n b j minus c j divided by 1 plus i to the power of j is equal to 0. In other words, it is IRR is the interest rate i star that causes the discounted present value of the benefits in a cash flow to be equal to the present value of the cost that is summation of j is equal to 0 to n b j divided by 1 plus i star to the power of j is equal to summation of j is equal to 0 to n c j divided by 1 plus i star whole to the power of j. Here we need to adopt an iterative and interpolative method. It goes something like this initially we need to assume a value of i star and we can calculate net present value which is NPV. If NPV is positive, it indicates that actual value of I star is more than the value assumed. 
then what we need to do? We need to increment i star by small value. And if NPV is negative, then decrement i star by a small value. So, this kind of arrangement we need to make to find out the IRR. And this has to be continued till we get a 0 value. So, let us take an example and also we need to see how this can be find out by interpolation method. So, once we know the interest at one condition, then we know the difference between the interest and the NPV values between two interest rate and multiplied by the NPV of interest at one. So, that is how we can find out what is the IRR by interpolation method. So, let us take an example. So, here initial investment is like 20,000 and we need to find out the IRR values. Okay. So, this is the solution. Maybe I can take help of spreadsheet. So, where is the spreadsheet? Investment is 20,000 which is negative and here we have year 1, year 2, year 3 up to year 6 and these are the values cash flows. Okay. These are the positive values. Then what we can do at 8 percent interest we can find out these values. So, this divided by 1.08 to the power of 1. Okay. So, that is how we have calculated. Then we can find out the other values. So, similarly for 12 percent because we need to find out for different uh, interest rate then only we can find out what will be the IRR. Okay. So, that way we can have different uh, tables for different uh, interest rate and then we can see what happens for 8 percent interest rate. NPV is found to be 2790. So, hence the discount rate has to be increased to make NPV is equal to 0. Okay. So, our target is to find out the NPV at 12 percent, 13 percent and 16 percent. So, we did it by using spreadsheet and we have find out what is the NPV values at that condition. At 8 percent it is 2780, at 12 percent it is 4556.67, at 16 percent minus 1508.5 because after 12 we have tried with 16 and it is found that it is negative. So, each value should be in between 12 and 16. Then lastly we have attempted 13 that also found to be negative. So, it is confirmed that IRR value should be in between 12 and 13. Okay. So, then what we did? We did the interpolation method like I r is equal to I 1 plus I 2 minus I 1 divided by NPV I 1 minus NPV N 2 and then multiplied by NPV I 1. So, same data we took from this table like I 1 is 12 because this is in between 12 and 13. 13 minus 12 is the interest rate difference and these values are taken from NPV at 12 percent and NPV at 13 percent and multiply with NPV at 12 percent then this is found to be 12.874. So, at this condition NPV will be 0 and this is the IRR where we will get the profit. Also we can study the effect of depreciation and tax on cash flows. So, depreciation refers to gradual loss of an asset's value with passage of time due to physical deterioration or technological obsolescences. So, it is treated as an expense and deducted from earning for earning for the purpose of tax calculation. And if E is the annual earning and T is the rate of tax and this is the depreciation, then we can write pre tax earning is E minus D that is total annual earning minus depreciation and tax will be something like this difference multiplied by, by the rate of tax 
and earning after tax will be E minus D and then this part okay? and cash flow will be E minus D minus this tax plus we have depreciation amount. So, it will be something like E multiplied by 1 minus T plus D into T and this D into T is referred to as the tax shield. Okay? Also, there are some methods like straight line depreciation methods by which you can calculate the depreciation. The annual amount of depreciation is calculated by dividing the initial cost of the asset by the number of years n in the estimated life. So, d is something like c naught by n, c naught represents the initial cost and n is the number of years of the lifetime or lifetime of the device or maybe equipment. If s is the annual sales amount, the depreciation is calculated by the expression like d is equal to c naught minus s divided by n. So, sales value need to be deducted from the initial cost. Also, we have one more term called book value, which refers to the remaining investment after the total amount of depreciation has been charged to date. It decreases every year until it reaches salvage value at the end of lifetime of the asset. So, let us take an example say solar steel cost rupees 4 lakhs. Normally, these solar steels are used to produce distillate from brackish water. So, we are considering the cost of a solar steel is 4 lakhs and has an expected useful life of 20 years. Its salvage value is estimated as 20,000. We need to compute the depreciation and year wise book value using straight line depreciation. So, how we can do it? What are the given things? We have C naught is 4 lakhs and salvage value is given to as 20,000 and n is the useful life which is 20 years. So, then we can find out what is depreciated amount. So, it is comes out to be 19,000 and initial book value is 4 lakhs, then book value at the end of first year will be C naught minus D which is equal to 3 lakhs 81,000 and book value at the end of second year this minus 19,000 depreciation every year it will depreciate. So, it will be 3 lakhs 62. Similarly, you can do it for third year and then at the end of 20 years it will be 20,000. Right? So, that is how we can do the calculation for depreciation okay? and this is one method of doing the calculation. So, with this we can summarize what we have discussed today. Primarily, we have discussed the need of energy economics and then what best practice we can follow to reduce the wastage of energy and how we can gain money out of it. And also we have covered energy economic schemes, an estimation of payback period, net present value IRR which are required to know the condition of the investment and then how we can get the best profit out of any investment in the energy saving projects. I hope you have got sufficient information in this presentation about energy eco economics and its importance and the tools which can be used for this analysis. So, thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you. Mm -hmm.